This is a brief summary of Pathwork Lecture 93, Main Image and Repressed Needs. It was the topic of the June 2018 monthly meetings, study guides, and weekly notices. When I do the study guides, I look to divide the lecture into four subtopics. In this lecture, three of them were given to me. The guide says from the beginning that he wants to go over how images were produced, repressed needs, and defensive mechanisms. The other topic I found was about overcoming resistance by making the work personal. So I'll start with that. What the guide, what the Pathic Lecture tends to describe about that is that this work can't really be done if you leave it conceptual, intellectual, about other people, about external things. The real work here is done by examining our own personal experiences, our memories of what happened during our life, but most importantly, our memories of how we felt at the moment, what our motivations were, and sometimes what we turned away from. Now this is something that only we can know. Only we can know where we were cruel, where we contracted so that we did not offer help when it was needed, when we spoke unkindly and then claimed that we didn't mean it. To do this work requires a level of honesty that is very, very difficult. It does require a lot of maturity. So the way to overcome the resistance in this work is to make it about you, to make the concepts about you, about your lives, and of course, that's where we can gain the most out of it. Now, the other reason why making it personal helps a lot is that learning the techniques and the words and the concepts is a little bit like learning the alphabet or learning how to put words together. These are very important skills. But ultimately, the point is to what you do with the words. So just as school children have to spend a fair amount of time learning relatively boring topics, they have to learn the alphabet, they have to learn to put words together, they've got to learn to spell, they've got to learn to build their vocabulary, so that when they are ready to express themselves, they have a knowledge of the language that they can use to do that. And that's what the Pathwork techniques and concepts are for. They are for your use in analyzing and looking at your life, in understanding yourself, in understanding the dynamics that you've become involved with in your life. So that by understanding how you personally operate, you will be able to see fairly quickly what Pathwork concepts are of value to you. And the idea is that that will lower your resistance to the work because you'll get some benefit out of it. So the guide turns to the three areas that he suggests that if we study them, if we learn more about them, it will be easier to find our own main image. And the three areas are, again, how an image comes into existence, the repressed needs that are the result of the process, and the defensive mechanisms that are also produced. So let me describe for a moment how an image comes into existence. Everyone feels hurts and frustrations. Everyone feels unhappiness and disappointment in life. And when we are children, small children, these can feel overwhelming. We haven't built up a life of our own. We haven't built up a personal history of successes. So that having a bad day can feel completely devastating to a young child. 
So these feelings are not just momentary feelings. They, they are, we, we think that they are going to be there forever. We don't see any way out of them. And so that leads us to try to find a solution. It leads us to believe another Pathwork concept, unity and duality, Pathwork Lecture 143. It leads us to believe that we're going to be killed by these feelings, that we're going to die. So finding a solution to our pain and disappointment is not a matter of modulating our lives. It becomes a matter of life and death. So we start looking for solutions. We start looking for ways out of the hurt and disappointment. And it's hit or miss, trial and error. And depending on our personality and depending on our spiritual path, we attempt to find a way to reduce the pain and disappointment. Different people are going to find different solutions. And this is where the work becomes individualized. So, I'm going to use myself as a case in this. And the reason I'm going to do this is in working on this lecture, I finally understood main image. I've read the lecture, I've studied the lecture, I've done work with the lecture. But I never felt that I could understand the primary dynamic in my life that my other images and issues uh, generated from. In other words, the main image is like the hub in a wheel. And then there are spokes that lead outward in a structure. But there's a central dynamic that makes sense once you find it. When I first studied this 20 odd years ago, it felt like the book reports that I used to be assigned when I was in school. And I always felt like a failure when they assigned book reports because I did not feel that I could adequately express the theme of a book in language that I could write down, make sentences out of, build a case for. Uh, so I was a, uh, I worked hard and I was a good student. So I would find things to say that would, would get me a good enough grade. But it wasn't the truth. So I felt like a failure even turning the work in, even getting a good grade, because I didn't feel that I was honoring the essence of the assignment. I knew I wasn't finding the central thread in the story most of the time. Now, you can chalk that up to, it wasn't one of my skills, but as a student, when you feel like a failure, that's just not seen as, one skill that you don't have that later you will hire someone to do or you will, you'll take a job where you don't have to do that. In school, they're trying to give you an all around experience and sometimes there's no way to avoid some of these exercises. When I found main image, when I first encountered main image, that's the memory that came to me of having to do a book report, of having to produce a phrase that described me in a very, in a sound bite. And my fear that I, I can't do that. When I came back to this lecture and decided to take a look at it, to see if I wanted to present it, I had exactly the same feeling, exactly the same memory. And I used that connection as an aha moment to say, well, I wonder if, my main image may be connected to that. And then I used the other tools and I wound up understanding, I'm willing to call it my main image, even if it's not the central one, it's closer to the center than I have ever been able to verbalize before. So as a child, when I felt hurt and disappointed, I thought it was me. I thought I wasn't good enough, I wasn't worthy, and so I, struggled to try to rebalance this, to find a place where I was worthy so I would be accepted and loved. We all do this. My solution tended to center upon producing results, making achievements, doing tasks, being of service, being of value. 
because I, I couldn't seem to get approval just for being me. I didn't seem to be accepted for just being me. But I could produce things, and those were acceptable. And that small dynamic when I was young, that, that was my solution, so I kept using it. And as I kept using it year after year, decade after decade, I got even better at it. It became who I was. Rather than talk about something or rely on companionship or connection, which I didn't feel I was very good at, like the book report, I would attempt to do something, to be of service, to give, to offer, to accomplish something, to receive approval and affection. So that's what we do, and that's how this turns into an image. My image was that if I was that kind of person, then I could get what I needed. That was a generalization. I took a few incidents when I was a child. I decided on a solution, and then I kept using that solution year after year, decade after decade. What happens when you use a generalized conclusion like that is it becomes very hard and rigid. It becomes the only way. We do not want to rethink our life every day. We do not want to rethink our life every week or every month. We want some things to start working so we can move on to something else. So these images sink down into our unconscious. They become habit. They become how we intuitively act. It becomes part of our persona. But because we're not aware of them, they just operate the way we developed them when we were younger. They don't grow with us. They don't stretch. They become hard, rigid, almost like plastic. In the lecture, uh, Patrick Lecture 83, on the idealized self-image, I've often used a cartoon that was drawn for Pathwork. And it's of two people who are trying to meet each other, but they're bow bowed under and they are carrying huge statues on their backs. And the statues are of who they imagine they could be or want to be. It is their idealized self-image. But underneath these two statues are these bowed over, sweating, haggard people who can't really connect with each other on a real level because they've got to support these images. And that's what an image becomes. So in the pathwork concept of image, the image becomes a generalized conclusion that becomes an operating system that we use without realizing it after a period of time. Now, where do repressed needs come in? My real need was to be loved and feel that I was accepted for who I am. Shifting to, I gave you something that you wanted, don't you approve of me, is not getting love. It's not being loved for who I am. It's being loved for what I produce. And so my desire for love and affection can't be met. And it still lays there. And I repress it. I just put it away. Because we don't want to sit in that hurt over and over, day in and day out. So we put it away. We repress it. And we stop feeling it. And that makes the image even more powerful because it's all we've got left. With repressed needs, the solution winds up being the next best thing, the best thing we can do since we can't get the real need met. And the second best solution winds up being the only solution that we develop, the only solution that we stay aware of. Another way to describe that is in Pathwork, there's a concept of negative pleasure. And negative pleasure means I can't get the bliss and joy that I feel that I deserve and want, but I can get this and this is okay. And so I settle for something. That means I don't continue to develop my capacity and my search for bliss and joy, what gives me bliss and joy. I wind up developing my capacity for this better than nothing thing. I shift my attention to a substitute. It's called negative pleasure because at some point that substitute won't give me what I need 
but I don't know what else to do. So I'll hang on to it like grim death, saying, well, it worked for 10, 20 years. If I work harder, if I push harder, it will work again. And it turns negative at that point. It's not constructive anymore. So if you can think of it this way, the solutions that we have when we were 20 that made our life function well aren't necessarily going to make our life as 30-year-olds function well. And it may wind up being a stagnant, uh, a way where our life goes stagnant when we're 40. And it may wind up turning out to be destructive by the time we're 50 years old. So this is where you can look at your images from the how you build an image, look back in your memories and see what you did instead of to get what you needed. Or you can look at needs that you have that have never been addressed. Now that, that's a very delicate process and it's important to unpack that with great love and gentleness. For that reason, sometimes it's the most positive way you can work with these materials is to read a lecture and then let it go. So I read the lecture 20, 25 years ago, didn't quite understand it. I certainly didn't see that the guide was giving me all these tools. Look at these three things and you'll, you'll understand it. Because I couldn't get it and it was frustrating to me, I backed away and I never really went back to that lecture voluntarily to take a look at it. In that way, I don't develop that part of me. I don't pay any attention to it. It reminds me of my failures in the book report. But at some point it surfaces again. And that's where only you know what you want to do. Only you know what you are honestly ready to learn about yourself. Only you know what part of you is strong enough to be taken apart and looked at. Nobody else can know this but you. So this is a very individual and personal path. Now, if we look at defense mechanisms, it's another very, very subtle but very pervasive uh, issue. The defense mechanism sees this life-death dynamic where death is feeling all this pain and life is finding a solution, a way out, a way to feel something else, anything else than the pain. The defensive mechanism is going to support the solution at any cost. So the defensive mechanism becomes very adept at disabling your capacity to see anything else. There's a phrase, we hear what we want to hear and we see what we want to see. And this is the danger of the defensive mechanisms. It hides the truth from us in the intent to support life-affirming actions, just wants to get us away from the hurt. So resistance is about many things. I'm going to describe two of them. Resistance is about being unwilling to see the part of us that doesn't function well. The analogy I use is all of us have places in our house where we have bunches of stuff crammed in boxes. Um, I think of it like a, like a closet where you've got this closet, you keep shoving stuff in the closet and you never really clean the closet. And then one day you say, gotta clean the closet. So you open the door and that it's overwhelming just to look at. And if you do want to take the time, you pull everything out of the closet. And of course it's chaotic, it's not orderly, uh, bits and pieces from different parts of your life. Uh, you have to figure out what this is, whether you want to keep it, uh, what, at, what place it has in your life now, or whether you need to let it go. And that's very hard because some of the things that we keep, we keep because there's a memory attached to it. We're not really keeping the thing. The thing triggers our memory. If we lose the thing, we're afraid we'll lose the memory. 
So it is very difficult sometimes to clean up the flotsam and jetsam of our life. But it's got to be done at some point. We need to use that closet. We need to find out what's in there. We want to be able to, uh, to, to use what is in there. So there's a period of time where we open the door, look in, and close the door again. And then you open the door and you close the door. One day, you decide to take things out. You get a few boxes out and you become discouraged and disheartened and you just put them back in and close the door again. There will come a day when you will be willing to do all or part of the work of clearing out that closet. Crises can happen that force you to do this work. When there is a crisis, it is very useful to already have the skills to understand the techniques and the concepts. Because during a crisis, you're not going to have time to do any learning. That's the time to exercise those skills, to use those techniques. So perhaps 20 years ago when I looked at this lecture, I didn't really understand images. I didn't understand defense mechanisms. I didn't even know I had repressed needs. So I couldn't have used the materials. It's not that I was stupid or cowardly or lazy. The time wasn't right. And it's not that I wasn't doing a lot more personal work. So as long as you're working and you're improving your life and you're building a better uh, relationship with people and you, all the things that we do when we do self-development work. There's no shame in dodging one or two topics. And we may be dodging them on the surface, but not really. We may be working on them in bits and pieces. The other analogy I use is of a sailboat. That for a sailboat to go from point A to point B, it has to use the wind, has to go back and forth. Sometimes it has to go way out of its way and then use the wind to tack back to where it needs to go. And sometimes when the wind stops, it has to wait. That's what our spiritual paths can be like sometimes. And it is character developing to be willing to learn to wait, to learn to cope with delays, to learn to deal with frustration. Now there's one more aspect of this, and that is that um, we, it requires a sense of awareness to undo all of this. And that sense of awareness comes in part from having tried to fix, let's say you're trying to fix 10 things in your life, and you've done a really good job with six or seven of them, and there's three left. After working on those three leftover aspects of your life for a long time, we become more willing to look at it from a different perspective. We become more humble about saying, maybe I didn't know everything I should have known. Maybe I don't know the right way to address this. And to, in honest um, openness, come at things from a different angle using different spiritual tools, using different techniques, reading different lectures. So a defensive mechanism needs to stop operating well before you're going to be willing to, to disassemble it, to deconstruct it. Your repressed needs need to feel that there's some hope if they're going to be felt again. It's just cruel to feel a need that can't be met. So it's important to give yourself a chance after so many years to address things again, things that you tried to address before and they didn't work. Well, that was then and this is now. And to be loving and gentle to yourself that this may also not be the time. But every time we address something, we have the chance to learn. So my experience in looking at this lecture this time and walking through the images and really listening to myself, listening to the memories that came up and noticing the criticisms, the feedback that I've gotten throughout my life and noticing what is left over today to get finally a sense 
that I try too hard. And I try too hard because I'm afraid that if I'm not trying, if I'm not pedaling very, very fast, that I, I won't have any value. I'll be seen for not having any value. And I worked with somebody today where I tried to support them and say, it is not loving to believe that anyone doesn't have value. And yet a very large number of people feel that they themselves don't have value. They'll see value in other people, but not in themselves. And sometimes in our defensive mechanism, we will project onto other people the lack of value that we feel ourselves. It takes tremendous courage to address these repressed needs. It takes a lot of wisdom. It takes maturity. And it takes love. So thank you for listening. I hope you read the lecture. I, I do my best to present it, but the lectures are always better than any other presentation can possibly make them. And thanks for listening.